Have you ever been in a situation where you wanted to create something new? Or wanted to persuade your friends to join in something that they've never heard of before? Or have you just simply loved something so much that you just want to share the joy of it with others? Well, we've said a huge yes to all three of these questions. We've created something new and persuaded our friends to join us and managed to share the joy of the activity we love so much with many others. It's that journey of what we did that we want to share with you today. We will be exploring some of the ups and downs along our journey, as well as share some of the lessons that we learned along the way. Just like any other journey, we had a beginning. And to be very honest with you, we felt really nervous and quite stuck. And the only way forward for us, as I'm sure it is often for you, is to take a big leap into the uncertainty and unknown. And now we'll let you in on what the adventure was. Hi, my name is Yijing, and I'm the current president of Melbourne University Dragon Boat Club. M-U-D-B-C, and also a graduate architect in a local Melbourne firm. And my name is Natasha, the current Vice President of M-U-D-B-C and a Doctor of Physiotherapy student at the University of Melbourne. It's been a long journey for us that got us to this point of running M-U-D-B-C together, so we thought we'd take you back right to the start with us. My story starts in Hong Kong, where Dragon Boat has an AFL equivalent status. And every year, my mum and dad would take me to the Dragon Boat Regatta on its own national holiday. As a chubby boy back then, I watched from the sidelines and wondered if I would ever be an athlete like that. The synchronized thump of each stroke with the drum beat just looked so enticing and I just wanted to be part of it. When I moved to Melbourne for uni, I wanted to keep fit. So I looked at Melbourne University's plethora of sports but none really stood out to me. So one day I walked past Melbourne's Yarra River and I came across this familiar boat, a dragon boat. And at that moment, I knew that my chosen sport would be a dragon boat. And that would be my connection back to Hong Kong, a link from my home away from home and a cultural identity I can latch myself onto. Sadly, at that time, Melbourne University didn't offer dragon boat as one of their sports. So I joined a local club instead. And my story starts in Singapore, where I spent most of my life growing up and also where I discovered the wonderful sport of sprint kayaking. It was during the six years of kayaking that I developed a deep passion for water sport and I made it my mission to try every water sport out there. The weightlessness and freedom that I feel when I'm out on the water is something that I find so unique and different from any other sport that I've done. Not only that, I'm obsessed with speed and I love going really, really fast. So upon my move to Australia, I wanted to find the next water sport that I could tick off my bucket list. I chanced upon Dragon Boat on my friend's Instagram story and coincidentally, the club where she did the Dragon Boat session at was also the club where Z was already a member of. So that's how we met. It wasn't long after that, that we went on to represent for Australia as part of the Auroras the Australian National Dragon Boat Team in Thailand. During that campaign, we quickly realized that there's a stark contrast of paddlers between the under 24s and other age groups. Not only that, but we found out currently in Victoria, our average Dragon Boat paddler's age is at 66 years old. And zooming out to the whole of Australia, that number doesn't really change that much. In our sport, there's a saying that goes like this, masters are the heart and soul of the sport, while youths are our future. As such, we definitely found the stark gap in the under 24s problematic because to ensure the longevity of our sport, we need the youths to continue the legacy of the masters. Z is an ideas guy and I remember we had so many to start with, but we started small by recruiting young people into our club at the time. Unfortunately, our focus of the under 24s clash with our club's focus of the Premier category. And that left us feeling stuck because that was our only chance of allowing youth access to the sport. Or at least that's what we thought. So we went back to the drawing board and we revisited one of the ideas that we had sort of shoved to the side because of how enormous a step it was. It was to create a new university Dragon Boat Club. Despite past relevant leadership experiences, I felt inadequate and nervous. 
Not only that, I also really liked the club that we were a part of back then. I kept hoping that there would be an alternative solution, but still, nothing. A couple of weeks later, we received an invitation to a university Dragon Boat Regatta in Wenzhou, China, and it sounded wonderful. From the opportunity to meet university Dragon Boat paddlers from all over the world, to enjoying free accommodation and transport while we were there. It sounded wonderful, but there was a catch, and that it was only for university clubs and not for, I guess, a random group of university students. I knew in my heart that this is exactly what we wanted to see more of in our sport and that our participation in this regatta could get the ball rolling for the youth category of Dragon Boat here in Australia. If this wasn't a sign to finally take the leap, I don't know what would have been. My feelings, thoughts and headspace were all very similar to Natasha's. It was a big decision, one that would change the course of our lives in university and beyond it. The idea of creating a club was more than merely just writing your usual constitutions or just signing paperwork. It was a commitment to each other that we would work our hardest and our best to something that's yet to be. It's to venture into deep waters without knowing where to navigate. And it's to search deep within ourselves to see what it really means to put action to our words. And it was daunting. It was, it was very daunting and it required a leap, a leap of faith. So if you were to imagine yourself taking a massive leap, what do you think might be your biggest challenge that you would have to overcome? If you said imposter syndrome, you're not alone because so did we. We doubted ourselves, we were fearful, and we felt like frauds. Imposter syndrome is a key issue in most of our lives, and you might experience this when going into your dream job, when moving to a new country, or even when you are presented with an opportunity as grand as a TEDx talk. In situations like these, you might find it difficult to accept your accomplishments, and you may even question whether you are deserving of them. For us, our leap of faith led us to experience the behind the scenes of the Dragon Boat world in a magnified and overwhelming way. And that made us feel extremely small and inadequate. A big reason for this was that this journey assumed us to see several roles at once due to the nature of starting up something new. And which usually requires co-founders to be jack of all trades before they manage to fill the committee positions with the right people. We were thinly spread over a long time and sometimes struggled to see the value in our work. But through it, we walked away with valuable shifts in our perception of imposter syndrome. Initially, we thought that perhaps the extent to which we felt inadequate was a sign that we were going down a path that maybe we were never meant to venture. But today we're here to tell you that if you ever feel that way, it simply is a sign that you're putting yourself up against an enormous and great challenge. And you know what? Kudos to you for feeling like an imposter because many people shy away before it gets too uncomfortable and it takes real guts to search for comfort in discomfort. Now moving on to the second biggest lesson we've learned, celebrating uniqueness. Can you ever recall a time when you felt like you didn't fit in? It could be because that you had different interests, different habits, or just different path in life. It might feel like you're in different wavelengths with everyone else around you. And it might make you feel that you don't belong at all. In our case, not only did MUDBC not have anything to its name because we were a new club, we were also up against household Australian sports like AFL, rowing and cricket to name a few. We were a minority here and we had a lot of work to do to make ourselves known in Melbourne University and by extension, the Victorian sports arena. To our surprise, people were drawn to us and they remembered us for the simple reason that we didn't blend in. After realizing that we could leverage on our sports uniqueness for marketing, we went a step further and leveraged on our unique multicultural and multilingual membership base that has members from all over the world. We did this through one of our major marketing moves, a multilingual interview that we rolled out during Melbourne's first lockdown in 2020. The aim of these interviews were to introduce our members to the world while celebrating their unique culture and heritage. We conducted interviews in Korean, Vietnamese, Cantonese, and German to name a few. 
and these ended up racking around 500 views each. This marketing stint widened our appeal to individuals from multiple backgrounds, whilst also giving our members a warm sense of appreciation and belonging. I hope these examples allow you to see the value of uniqueness and also inspire you to celebrate it. Being special and wonderfully different is your selling point and it will speak and provide for itself. You are filling whatever gap there is and you are making a difference by being present. Our next lesson has to do with asking for and receiving help. You're in a situation where you clearly need help, but you seem to struggle asking for it. Well, does that sound familiar to you? It could be because you fear surrendering control to someone else, or because you're worried that you might come across too needy, or because you feel imposing or being a burden to someone else. It is commonly thought that asking for help is a sign of weakness, but quite to the contrary, it is a sign of strength, confidence, and resourcefulness. Our journey included many moments of struggle. For instance, we struggled to purchase essential equipment and even find a suitable training location. However, we were met with kindness at every step, from other people gifting us paddles to even loaning us life jackets. This was also true for us when we turned to grants for funding. There's so much support out there for people trying to make a positive difference, be it championing equality, female empowerment, or mental health, there's something for everyone. So our club covers all these areas and thankfully qualified for numerous grants that allowed us to earn approximately 11,000 Australian dollars over three years. We've used this money to purchase paddles, life jackets, and even our own paddle ergometer. All it took from us was to admit that we needed help and to accept it. There is so much value in asking for help. No man is an island and no one is truly self-sufficient. And at various points in our lives, we need others to lift us up to heights that we'd have never been able to reach ourselves. In addition to learning how to accept help, we would also need to learn how to accept rejections because most of the time, this comes in tandem with asking for help. I agree with that. And that's not only applicable to when you're asking for help. You might face rejection from a company that you applied for a job at, from a group of friends, or even from a love interest. <laughs> We've all been there. Regardless of the type of rejection though, the reality is that it hurts. When you've given it everything you've got, only to be turned away, it's enough to stop anyone from putting themselves out there again. Definitely. Rejections are lethal to one's self-confidence, especially when compounded with self-doubt. For us, we were the change to an established community. And like for most people, change is scary. And it felt like we were salmon swimming against the current as we faced rejection after rejection. And if you find yourself in a similar situation, we'd like to share three things that helped us and may also help you. Number one, process your emotions and let yourself overcome those feelings. Number two, reflect on why you got rejected in the first place and the reason behind it. And number three, remind yourself of your end goal, why you started in the first place. Because this is a huge source of motivation and especially when times get tough. Now we're on to our final lesson, valuing your community. No matter the journey that you set out on, you're bound to find yourself in a community. And while it is sometimes more efficient to imagine yourself as the lone character in your storyline because of how then everything only relies on you, it is worthwhile to consider your place in the community as well as the ripple effects from yourself and everyone else. Being a part of a community gives us a sense of belonging and it gives us a sense of being part of something that's greater than ourselves and a sense of security. It provides us with the golden opportunity to network with others and learn from their successes and failures. In many ways, a community is like a safety net. Throughout our journey, we made it a point to work smart in addition to working hard. We established numerous symbiotic relationships with mentors and friends that led to exchanges of ideas and best practices and allowed the continuous growth and development of all parties involved. 
I'm reminded of an African proverb that my father reminded me of frequently growing up. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. One of our most exciting things that came out of these relationships was the idea to have a sister club partnership with Hydra, a youth focus club in Canberra. This came into fruition at a national regatta earlier this year, where we put together both our club names and paddled together as Mydra. It was great fun and a beautiful experience getting to know others in our age group who love the sport as much as we do. And we also caught a glimpse of what the young people could bring to the wider dragon boat landscape. Enthusiasm, drive, and also most importantly, longevity. It's, it is heartening to reminisce about the club's achievements in the past three years and note how far we've come as one team. We've competed both locally and internationally and grew the club membership base to 46 amazing individuals. And now we even have the special opportunity to share our story on this great TEDx stage. MUDBC got the ball rolling for expanding Dragon Boat's youth division here in Victoria and we have the potential to inspire and offer guidance to other potential club bearers to do the same in the future. We greatly condensed a long and eventful three years within this speech, but we hope that we've inspired you to take a detour too, if your situation requires that of you. Be comforted by the fact that an initial plan usually doesn't play out to become the final plan, because one rarely knows enough in the beginning to inform the whole course of their journey. As Anthony Lysion put it beautifully, dead end roads doesn't mean you've come to your end. It just means that you have to take a different detour. So dream big, invest in yourself, and muster the courage to go for big calculated risks so that you can reap great and unique rewards too. It's gonna to be tough, but the grit and resilience that become a part of you is priceless. It will be scary, but just remember that fear is nothing more than just a feeling. And lastly, there will be doubters, but take that detour anyway. Thank you.